Whenever a child is born, there's generally a prayer that's prayed. And that prayer kind of goes, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And sometimes if the mother, the father, the grandparent, the guardian, whoever teaches that child that prayer, every once in a while that child will fall asleep and he won't be in his own room. That parent, take that child up from wherever he fell asleep. Take him to a place of rest, his own bedroom. Give him a kiss and say, good night, my child. I'll see you in the morning. And with that same respect, that same honor, and that same love, we say to our dear sister, Constance, good night, Constance. We'll see you in the morning. You may be seated. Well, this morning we give you greetings. I am the pastor here of the Inspiring Body of Christ Church, Pastor Ricky Rush. And it is with a wonderful honor that we thank those members workers from the Evergreen Funeral Home today who are here, who have been so professional, so personal with making sure that the services for our dear sister Constance Jones have been handled in the greatest manner with the utmost dignity. I appreciate all of you who have set aside some time today. Of course, this time was not scheduled. It was unplanned. But as busy as everyone is, and as tough as things are around us, you have made the time today to come out and say to our sister and her family, we appreciate you, we love your, your life, your life story, and we're just here to say thank you uh, this morning. Now, we're going to follow our printed program, and there are a couple of things. If you know of anyone right now that would like to stream this program, someone who is not in this building, they can go to ibocchurch.org, I-B-O-C Church, and that's with two C's, one I-B-O-C, and then the next C will say church, ibocchurch.org, and the service will be streamed in its entirety. We are also wanting to make sure that everyone's aware of our time restraints that are on us this morning. And as we have to be at our burial site at a certain particular time, so we're going to allow everything on the program to take place. And if we have to draw back any time, then I'll be the one to make sure that the time is drawn back. I appreciate your patience today. As we're here with uh, Brother Jones this morning, we're here with Constance's father, and we're going to make sure that everyone understands. We love fellowshipping and touching, but I am, I don't even know of a, 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 I don't know how to say this, but I'm just going to say it because I've been a very real person all my life. Um, we want to make sure that we uh, respect the distance between Brother Jones and everyone else in the building today. And that's for a lot of different reasons, okay? So if you all, you know, if you see him, you just wave and all he'll, You'll understand, and I am so grateful to God on behalf of this entire church, uh, our board, to my wife, Sister Rush, who's with us this morning. We would like to thank you for just allowing us to be with you. Now, everybody in this room today is uh, looks to be grown folk. All right? If you sit next to a grown folk, just look at them. Just look at them. That's a grown folk next to you. In other words, we understand what respect is. Now, Constance was a runner, okay? Uh, uh, and when I mean runner, she ran this race in life. And when a runner normally wins or goes across the finish line, we have two things that we do. We cheer or we give an ovation. And there's nothing like a parent who's in the stands and watches their child finish a race. It didn't matter if that child was first place, third, 15th. When your child crosses the line, you're proud. And so today, I don't know if Brother Jones ever watched Constance in any athletic events. I really don't know that for sure. 
But I do know that today she finished her race this week, and today we celebrate her crossing the finish line. So even if it's not in your culture, if it's not your style, if it's, if it's your, you're not the kind of person that would do this, can all of us, out of respect, before we say any other word, just stand up right now and give this runner a standing ovation? She crossed the line, y'all. Come on. You can put your hands together just a little bit. Thank you so much. There you go. Well done, Constance Michelle Jones. Now, while you're standing, can you turn to someone right now? I don't do one of these. I'm not one of these turn to your neighbor kind of preachers. I'm not really into that. But can you just for just a minute, you know, let them know that if you're at the service for Constance Jones, let that person next to you or behind you know, tell them, say, I'm a nice person. Okay, okay, so sit down. So anything you say from this, therefore, will come from a nice... See, Constance was a nice person. So this is a nice person funeral. Amen. <laughs> I see someone asking some guys to come up and sit with them now. If you want to move around, change seats, you can do that. We're going to have our um, song of comfort. Is Natalie in the building? Natalie, Natalie's going to come. And Natalie, you can st stay closer if you'd like. And then after Natalie comes... Uh, uh, Dr. Ma, Michael Jala is going to come with both of our scriptures. And then I'm going to ask Michael, if you don't mind, to give us a prayer. Can you do that, sir? He's going to give us a prayer also. And then we're going to go into expressions of love. All right? Thank you so very much. It's in your hands now. I can only imagine what all I will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I stand dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Yes, I can only imagine. I can only imagine when that day comes and I find myself Standing in the sun, I can only imagine what all I will do when forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine, I can only imagine. To be surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine to be surrounded by your glory. What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Yes, I can only 
can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine. Scripture reading from the Old Testament and the New Testament. For the Old Testament, as a misprint, we want to do Psalms 23 instead. Psalms 23. And it reads, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall, I shall not want. Make it mean to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, so much so that my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. The passage chose in our printed text for the New Testament scripture is Matthew chapter 20, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. And it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden, my burden is light. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy, holy word. Let us bow. O oh God, our, our Father. Oh Lord, we, we come right now just to, just to say thank you for how you've demonstrated your love toward us and for us. Lord, we're grateful that you did that in the giving of your only begotten Son, Jesus, our, our Christ. Then, Lord, we thank you for the comfort and presence of the Holy Spirit. Oh God, we are grateful that long after we have left this service, that we'll be able to call upon you and glean strength and lean on you. Lord, I say thank you for this life. Father, realize that it's not how long we live it's what we do with the life you loan us. Lord, we pray for this father and pray for this family. Oh, God, we're grateful. That those that are gathered together today, we pray your blessing upon your spirit even right now that you will be with us, oh, God. Lord, we realize that there will be days, there will be days into the, 
the yesteryears of yonder. But help us to remember the good times, how you've been there with us and for us, even when we could not find anybody else. And then, Lord, we ask a special blessing upon Pastor Rush and those that will, will be a part of this program. Oh, God, give him words of comfort and conviction to have us to know that even though we might weep, but we don't weep as those who have no hope. And so, Lord, we thank you once again for this life. Thank you for this service. And pray, oh God, that you will continue to be with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And for his sakes we say amen, amen, and amen. Thank you so much, Pastor, for those scriptures and words of encouragement. Now, we're here at um, this point of our program where we're going to have some expressions of love. Um, if there are any um, resolutions that have not been turned in or that are present today that um, we can make sure uh, are acknowledged if you have a resolution, I have a resolution here from the IBOC church family. But if you are here and would, uh, if you brought a resolution uh, to read or to have presented and uh, you have not presented it so far to the family, would you just stand for just a moment before we get to the expressions of love? If you have a resolution from any organization or church or community involvement team, neighborhood, no one? Oh, I just wanted to make sure I did not uh, bypass anyone. At this time, we're up to one of my favorite uh, parts of any funeral, and those are the remarks. Now, we are under some time constraints today uh, that are beyond our control. And I always love the part of remarks because it's the part where we usually find uh, things uh, that are fun to remember, um, uh, fun things uh, that we can reflect some history that we don't know about. And also it's the time when most people's feelings are hurt because somebody took up the other folks two minutes. And nobody says anything about it until later on and the next person tries to go over two, then five. And before you know it, there is no eulogy needed because they've all been given. So what I want to do today to make sure that everybody, though as, as many as possible, gets a chance to be included in this part of the service. And if you are here today, remember you're a nice person because Connie was a nice person and we're all nice people. And I was a nice pastor to her. And so we always laugh in this church. If laughing is not a part of your religious experience, you're going to break all your religious curses for a minute because today we're going to laugh a little bit. All right. So now if you are in the building, except for the people in the immediate family that we're going to ask them to stay seated. Everyone else, though, I need everyone else in the whole building to stand up for just a minute. OK, come on. Come on, y'all. We're up to these expressions and we're going to we're going to be able to participate. There you go. I know I know that noise we make when we stand up now. That's why we're late coming in here today. I made those noises this morning. Oh. All right, so here's what we want to do. Everybody, we're going to have one word that we're going to all say together in a minute. I love this part. I love doing this. This is great. The word is going to be the word something, okay? Just one word. The word is going to be the word something. If you've never been to a funeral at IBOC before, or if you've never been a part of this particular part of our culture, we're going to say the word something, all right? Everybody got it? Family, I want you to just look around real quick. There are some people who didn't know Constance, but they know you. There are some people that... You know that they don't know. Just look at how many people today came out on a day like today, as cold as it is, to just tell you how much they love and appreciate you and to support you who won't be able to come by the house or something, but they're here today. I just wanted you to see how many people showed up. Now, to those of you that are standing, I need you to do, remember that word. I want you to take your powerful right hand. I want you to point it toward this family right now. There you go. A lot of power, a lot of dignity, a lot of strength, a lot of age, a lot of wisdom. All right, now when I say now, I want you to say that word. But you got to say it now. You got to say it the way Constance would say it if she was on stage. Y'all got it? Ready for that word? Say it. Okay, that was like the audition. Let's pretend now you made the role. Ready? Come on with some power. Don't be afraid of those people next to you. They're nice people. Ready? Say it again. 
Oh, great. Now you can sit down. All right. So everybody had a chance to say something. That's the remarks. I'm doing pretty good. Am I doing pretty good, Erica? Karen, am I doing good so far? We're right on schedule. So you cannot say, I went there and they didn't let me say anything. You said something twice, as a matter of fact. That's how we get past all that. Now, the family has, <laughs> you're a nice person, remember now. The family has also had, chosen some of you. Now, okay, really, if there are any of you that want to say something else, because I don't need any enemies. But if, if, you, if that was just not enough for you, and there's one thing you can say, but now we've used a lot of your two minutes. You're down to 30 seconds. And that's a long way to that mic. But if you would like to seriously have something else to say, then I don't, I don't mind. I'll take the hit. However, the reflections, uh, we have a Reflections of a Legend video presentation that's going to be played. And if our audiovisual team, which I'm so graciously grateful for, for being here today, and, and um, we have young people who set up our audiovisual team and they just kind of run everything technically, and our instructor is here today. So we're going to play that video if it's ready. Afterwards, Mary Collins Agency will have some reflections. Uh, and I believe Jane Patterson and, and Gladine, you know your names, are on the program already presented. So is everybody ready? We're going to focus on the video screens behind us for this video, first video presentation. At the American Heart Association, the majority of our day-to-day -day business revolves around volunteer staff partnerships. Using dramatization, we're going to demonstrate how strong volunteer staff partnerships and clear communications can enhance volunteer performance, keys to AHA's success. Hello, I'm Constance Jones, and I'm here to talk about getting to the heart of AHA business. You see, here at Bennigan's, the opportunities are endless. Many of our managers were developed from employee ranks. Part of our commitment to you is if you should have any question, whether it's about training or anything else, make sure you contact the trainer or the manager as soon as possible. You can learn more about the programming packages available in your area by calling a TCI customer service and sales representative at the number on the screen. The tough economic times that have hit U.S. businesses have also hit U.S. cities. After all, a city is a business, employing thousands of people working hard to keep operations running smoothly and efficiently on a balanced budget. Over 2,100 doctors. That ours is one of them. Drugs? You want to end up like your father? Child abuse is colorblind. You must really hate me to do something like that. Something new, not the usual. Long John Silver's from a different school. Holiday shopping's really a pain because everyone on my list has everything they need. Then I adopted Susan, my angel. I mean, my whole attitude changed. I couldn't wait to go shopping for gifts that will make her Christmas special this year. I resign and I get... $75,000. That's a hell of a settlement. That's hush-up money. That's be quiet and go away money. You become a problem and the board wants you to stop. Like I was never a problem until I started being your soldier. 
You weren't a problem before because, honest to God, Chris, you never took a stand before. The district gave me hell for things that happened at some other school, a private school. You had a chance to defend yourself. You wasted it. I sat through your review. I saw you get crushed by the whites on one side and the Hispanics on the other. A kid got beat. A girl got harassed. It's not all about race. A black student got beat. The Hispanics rallied around their own. And the minute a black administrator tries to say something about it, they find a way to move you out the door. What do you think it's all about? I'm not getting pushed out because I was trying to do right. Do you understand what's going on here? Lift up your faces. You have a piercing need for this bright morning dawning for you. Birthday party. A huge $25 million exposition in Dallas with all Texas playing host. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Lift up your eyes upon the day breaking for you. A dramatic combination of modern architecture and the simple beauty of the old world. Give birth again to the dream. Take it into the palms of your hands. Mold it into the shape of your most private need. Sculpt it into the image of your most public self. Lift up your hearts. Each new hour holds new chances for new beginnings. Do not be wedded forever to fear, yoked eternally to brutishness. The horizon leans forward, offering you space to place new steps of change. Here, on the pulse of this fine day, you may have the courage to look up and out, and upon me, the rock, the river, the tree. Here, on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes, into your brother's face, your country, and say simply, very simply, with hope. Good morning. Wow. Glory to God. We're here to celebrate the life of a person who always made change, caused change, and produced change in our community. At this time, um, we're going to have those personal reflections, okay? Uh, if you are here, Mary Collins or Jane or or Glending or Helen or Walt, um, if you'll make your way to this mic at this time, go ahead. Right, share right there. Thank you. Well, as you can see in her wardrobe, she always chose blue. Um, I'm Mary Collins, and this is Kim Trusty. I've asked her to stand with me today because together we have represented Constance for 34 years. It has been the privilege of our career. We signed Constance wow. in 1990, and Kim was already with me then. My other agents are here today. And this is just such a, a difficult but a special time for us because we loved her dearly. I became her agent in 1990, and we have determined as best we can that she didn't really have another agent before us, um, at, at least not for very long. So for almost the entirety of her well-regarded career. And when I say well-regarded, 
I don't just mean by her clients and the many people who have hired her and booked her over the years. I mean by her fellow actors, by directors, producers, recording engineers, casting directors, makeup artists, and all the people that are involved in, in the business of show, as we call it. When I heard the news, like all of you, when Erica called me, I was stunned, devastated, shocked, and then I had to go and take on the task of letting my team know about it. We are not just a team, we are a family. Um, we worked very closely with Constance, and when you represent someone, you know pretty much everything about them. Um, I know I'm only supposed to do this for two minutes, but I'm an agent. Right. And we don't know how to be brief. <laughs> We've spent 34 years promoting and talking about Constance, so I will do my best. Um, we knew it would be important to gather samples of her work for all of you to see, to, to demonstrate, for those of you that didn't know that side of her or that world of ours, how exceptional she was, how versatile she was. As you can see, and I won't delineate it all, but she did everything. Film and television series, commercials, corporate video. Not singing. Not singing. <laughs> did not want to sing. No. And dancing whenever she could. Um, if there was a dancing call, she would get it. Um, she did print ads, video game voices, political voice ads. She had a gorgeous, gorgeous voice. Uh, she also, um, performed in several stage productions while she was with us. Miss Evers Boys, which we noted, uh, Diva, The King and I, and she also performed in several prestigious stages all over the country in New York, LA, Chicago, and even London. I want to acknowledge that our other two agents are here. Uh, Sarah Rhodes, who is her agent and worked very closely with Constance for almost 15 years. Sarah said she could cry beautifully. That oh. is a real skill in acting. Uh, a lot of actors can't cry, That's right. can't cry on demand, and a lot cry really ugly. <laughs> Constance <laughs> cried beautifully, and she refused to cuss. Whenever she would have an audition, she would not do it if she had to cuss. Amen. But what we thought was funny was when Sarah would have her into the office to do auditions, if she blew a take or couldn't read a line completely, she would say something like, aw, poopy. <laughs> She had such cute little sayings like that. Kim, who is our talent director, she knew and worked with Constance, as I said, the entire time. She ta always talked about what beautiful skin and hair she had, how sweet and funny she was, and of course, how she adored cobalt blue. I can just see every wardrobe person holding up a piece of clothing going, which one do you want to wear? It was going to be the blue. And she loved to have take her headshots in blue. She was seriously addicted to Dr. Pepper, which I guess we all knew. And she could not read a map. So Kim had to give her directions by hand, by any way possible, to get her to the various locations when she was shooting on location, <laughs> turn by turn, step by step, even after Google and the internet. Alice Gallup, who is also here, who I would like to credit with editing that video. Alice pulled that together immediately, and I just think it really speaks to Constance's work. She's our operations manager. She works very closely with Constance regarding her finances, her marketing materials, and anything else that Constance needs. Alice was there for her. She recalls how very sensitive Constance was about people and how she uh, was such a dear heart. And her love of dogs was intense. Alice and she shared that. And she believed she spent more money on her animals than she did herself. And I would agree to that. If we needed her to do anything or get new pictures, she would do it only if she had taken care of the puppies first. And yes, she had a Dr. Pepper addiction. We sent uh, a note to all of the actors and they were as devastated as we were. Many wanted to come here today and for different commitments could not be. But we wanted to share just a couple of things that they shared because these are actors who have worked alongside Constance and in the studio with Constance for years. One of our actors, Bob Reed, said he could remember so many times they shared a laugh and kind words on jobs and auditions where they read together, hoping to get the job. He said leaving the audition, Constance would weak at him, which I can just see, and would say, wouldn't it be fun if we booked this together? He loved working with her and said he was shattered and what a loss. Another of our actresses, Ellen Losey, who is here today, told me some wonderful stories. They were very close. She knew Constance and worked well and often with her. She said to me, this is devastating news. I'm dumbfounded and so, so sad. 
Constance was the best and the most fun to work with. Working with her was pure pleasure, and you knew you'd have a good day on set if Constance was there. She was smart, calm, considerate, professional, a terrific actor, and so, so funny. As you know, a sense of humor goes a long way in helping everybody survive a difficult or overnight shoot or easing tension on a stressful set. Producers and directors loved working with her as much as her fellow actors did. And then one just quick story, uh, another one of our actors, Julio Cedillo, he and Constance went to Mexico to shoot a film, and he's bilingual, so they just assumed he knew how to do a Mexican hat dance. <laughs> he did not. And Constance, and you can just see it, put her hands on her hips and said, you're Mexican and you don't know how to do a Mexican hat dance? <laughs> so she proceeded to teach him how to do it. Other comments were, what a beautiful soul. I shared many laughs with her. She was my mentor. She was such a true and loving soul. What a wonderful person. I could go on and on, and I, I, I can't, but I would. <laughs> um, more than anything else, everyone agreed Constance was thoughtful and caring. She always put everything and everyone above her, as you all know. She never failed to acknowledge us, and as agents, we're all about the actors, but she never failed to acknowledge us on holidays, check in with us. She always sent us a photo, a card, and when the internet, then she'd send internet cards of her puppies, all dressed for the holiday, oh, nice. Mother's Day hats, those poor dogs, <laughs> they, they did whatever, and we, we just loved it. We also had in her bio, that we noted that she had personally rescued over 200 animals and was affectionately known by her neighbors as the dog lady. She was always so attentive to us, and I would like to close with a few words she sent us. Hard. <laughs> My acting has prepared me to go to work and act like all is well, then crumble as I'm heading home. I can share that with you because you're not just my agency, you are my family. And through the years, trials and tribulations, family blessings and tragedies, you all have been with me for the ride. I love you and I'm so proud to be part of my Mary Collins Agency family. Constance, we consider you our family and we loved you very much. You will always be part of the fabric of this agency and we could not have been more proud to call ourselves your agents. Thank you. Thank you. First, give an honor to God, to the presiding ministers, and to the family this morning. We come on behalf of the line dancers that are here today, that family that meant so much to Constant and meant so much to us. I'm joined today by Jane Patterson, Glendine Tatum, and Helen Washington. We all come with a question, why, why constant and why now? And in times like this, I draw upon words that I heard a long, long time ago. And a writer wrote that, I can't not make a world and hold it in my hand. I cannot make the lightning flash across the land. I cannot take a piece of clay and mold it into a man. I cannot name the stars above or count the grains of sand. But I have a father, you have a father, constant had a father in heaven who can. But we know that constant love dance, but she loved the Lord more. And I'm reminded that several days before Constant left us, we lost Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. I've known Eddie Bernice since 1988. I had an opportunity in Indianapolis, Indiana to attend a legislative event I was representing the state of Alaska and she represented Texas. And at that event, 
I wanted to get on the floor and do the Texas swing with Eddie Bernice Johnson. But lo and behold, Eddie Bernice didn't pay much attention to dance. And so it didn't, it didn't, it didn't work at all. And so when, I, when we asked the question, well, why constant? And I can envision here that when Eddie Bernice went before her master in that mansion of many rooms, and he commended her for her work on this earth, he asked her, Eddie Bernice, what do you want? And she's saying, I want to learn how to dance. <laughs> I want to learn how to dance. And what did the Lord do? He doesn't make any mistakes. He reached down. He selected our blue monarch butterfly. He selected our precious dear constant and then said, you two friends, Eddie Bernice, you have the best. Constant Jones is going to teach you how to dance. That's good news. And with that, I want all of the line dancers to please stand and be recognized at this time. Wow. Amazing. So, so where do you all dance? What's that? Where do you dance? Oh, we, we dance all over. Really? Uh, Park in the Woods, uh, Thurgood Marshall, Beckley Sainer. Wow. Me. Do you well, ever all come together and like do a big, like a dance at a church or anything like that? We, we do dance out at, based upon invitations, yes. That's so cute. I celebrated my 80th birthday a couple of days ago. And I dance because oftentimes when we go to the rest home facilities, there are men there that yeah. are 20 year my junior. And I want them to see that if I can do it at 80, you can do it at 60. Wow. Yeah. Hey man, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Good news, Eddie Bernice and Constant of dancing the Texas swing <laughs> with our Father in heaven. Amen. Thank you so very much. Amen. All right. I won't be long. My name is Ezra Clark. And uh, the first time that I met Constance, the first thought that I had in my head is that she had great diction. You know, when she spoke, it was always eloquent. I don't care what she was talking about. It was always eloquent. And my wife and I, we just couldn't let this opportunity pass without expressing the, the, the joy that we experienced with her and with William and the honor that they bestowed upon us by introducing us to their parents. So I just couldn't let this moment pass without getting up here and, and, and saying at least something. So uh, thank you. We have one more remark after my brother here. Good afternoon. And then we'll move forward. Family and friends of Constance. Michelle Jones. Um, in the uh, early 80s, Constance came to us. We did a play, the longest running African American play in the United States, where we went to London, Canada, all the major cities here in uh, the United States. When I got the call from Nikki, Baltimore, down to Houston, second, they called Chicago first. I called John and Danny in Chicago, Clarence and Byron and Thomas in Houston, uh, Curtis and Alex in LA, and DT in Germany. We couldn't believe it. Um, I mean, we just couldn't believe it. We took care of her. She was, well, D said it the best. I was talking to him in Germany, and he, he got it mixed up. He thought maybe he was talking about Nikki. And about five minutes in, he said, wait a minute, you mean our Constance? 
And that says it the best, our Constance. We took care of her on the road. She was the only female with 11 or 12 of us. Traveling around the road is rough if you're an entertainer. She taught me how to dance, the dance that we needed to do on stage. I was her run and get her Dr. Pepper, and if she didn't get it, it was a little crazy. She was definitely hooked on Dr. Pepper. I think y'all feel the same way I do when I say she was our Constance. Our Constance. Good morning. My name is Cheryl Lewis Edwards, and I was Connie's childhood bestie, is what we called it, from ages, age eight all the way up to about age 18. I, I'm standing here to represent those who knew Connie. So with those from the Woodacre area, and also Bishop Dunn, if you are here, will you please stand? Amen, Bishop Dunn. Wow. Bishop Dunn or Woodacre, the Lara Land area, please stand, thank you. I'd just like to say a few words about Cunny. So Cunny and I were road dogs. We did everything together, went to the movies together, uh, we snuck out and did things we probably weren't supposed to do together. We parked down, uh, well, we would walk down to the Kmart on Ledbetter. How many of you remember that Kmart? <laughs> wow. We walked down there, snuck down there together, and, and our dads were, were very strict on us. They said, don't you go down to that Kmart. And we would still find a way to go down there, get some popcorn. Well, if he didn't know, he knows now. But anyway, um, before there was Constance, there was the beautiful Cunny. There was the kind Cunny. There was the loving Cunny. In fact, boys would come from over in the Redbird area, come by my house, I'd sneak out, and they'd say, where is Cunny? So we truly had some wonderful times, and it's just a blessing. As you get older in life, you do separate. I lived abroad, I got married, she stayed here, she traveled, and we reconnected a few years ago, which was a blessing. And we even spoke not long ago. So with all that being said, I'd like to say to Billy and to Mr. Jones, Although this is a time of sadness and mourning, Connie is celebrating. She's celebrating in heaven with her mother and other family members, and she will be missed. And I thank God for the time that I had with her, growing up with her. Love you, family. Thank you. Hello. My name is Tanya Studemeyer, and I know Constance and Connie. <laughs> um, came to know Connie from our modeling days about 35 years ago. Um, she actually was introduced to me uh, and a uh, production company called Kawima Productions, and she was a commentator. So not only did she model, she commentated as well for many, many productions. And um, what I remember about Connie, because that's what I've always called her was Connie, um, what I remember about her was we, we were in, of similar age, literally two years from each other, but I always thought Connie was older because she was so elegant and mature, and she knew what she wanted to do. There was no question. And she showed us how we could do it too, right? She was always wanting to coach somebody and uplift somebody and bring them along. Um, she was a beautiful woman, but not just beautiful on the exterior, she was beautiful to the core. And we just thank her for being all of our big sister, whether she was younger or older, she was everybody's big sister, because that's who she was. 
Um, I, I really want, you see a lot of stunning, beautiful people in this room. I want everybody who modeled with Connie or she commentated a show or, yeah, y'all stand up. All the models in here, right. all the people where Connie commentated a show for you, all you brothers up front, yes. Give it up, y'all. These are people who've known Connie for well over 35, 40 years for some, That's right? right? That's and to, right. To, to have them here speaks volumes. She was that kind of friend. To have people show up in your life 40 years later wanting to show love and support, that speaks volumes over your life. Um, I just want to say to Karen and Erica, to the family as well. Billy, I met you a long time ago. I don't know if you remember me. I never got a chance to meet Mr. Jones. But speaking on behalf of my sister Karen and my sister friend Erica, love you two to the moon because putting together something like this for somebody that you love to the core of your being is not easy to do, not at all easy to do, so we commend y'all for what you've done, for Billy, for what you've done, for Mr. Jones, for what you allowed. We thank God for aligning our lives so that we would be in the presence of Constance Connie Jones at some point in her life. Thank you, God. Thank you. I'm Brian Rogers, and I'll be brief. Um, when I got the news of Connie's passing, I was telling my friends that my babysitter had died. And they asked me, well, how are your kids taking it? And I was, well, they're, they're fine. And they were like, they looked confused. I said, my babysitter passed. At age 50, I only had two babysitters, Connie and Cheryl Jones, Connie, <laughs> Connie Jones and Cheryl Coyne. And um, I want to say this to you, Connie. Thank you for never snitching on me. Thank you for never telling uh, anything that I did to my parents, and thank you for allowing me to stay up long past my bedtime. I thought you didn't pay attention most of the times, but listening to everyone speak so highly of you, you were just a nice person because you never yelled, you never cursed, you never really fussed at me that I can remember. So thank you, we love you, and you will forever be my babysitter. Thank you. Wow. I think that all of you would agree that every one of those comments and every one statement was very well time well spent and was just very cherished. Um, we do have a time that we have to be uh, on from this place, but I am again going to, if it means take away some moments here in the eulogy, I, I get it, I understand it, and plus I'm the pastor. I can have fun with that. So we're going to have Karen. Now, now, did any of those who had reflections get up? I heard a lot of people, but I want to make sure that those, those that were on the program had a chance. Now we're going to hear from Karen and Erica. Karen, the video first, then Karen, then Erica, then the song, then the benediction, because I'm not doing eulogy now. No, okay, so, so the video will come next, then Karen and Erica. All right. You can tell these are all Connie's friends, right? We're all having a good time. Getting any communication from our control center? Okay, the, the video was presented and brought to us, so we had 
don't know what went on with the production of it. That's okay. Now we're going to go to... <clears throat> I told you, Karen, Erica. I told you. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Right. Yes, you did. <laughs> well, hello, and um, just acknowledging the pastor of this church, Pastor Richard Rush. To everybody that joined today, um, thank you for coming and spending some time with this family. My name is Karen Mann, and I ask that you just be patient with me for a little bit. I won't be long, but I'd like to share some personal insight about my beloved friend, Connie. Uh, I wrote this down because I didn't want to forget anything, but actually, there are not words that are adequate to convey what the loss of her in my life really means. So Connie always imagined, like you heard a minute ago, who she was and, wanted, and what she wanted to pursue personally and professionally. And she did it on butterfly wings. Connie was especially fond of the monarch butterfly and the color Electra Blue. Some people call it cobalt blue. So when you Google the word friendship, it says it's a relationship of mutual affection between people. However, for Connie and I, that description is an understatement. Not only did we create a successful business partnership in the fashion show circuit, and actually I just want to acknowledge Ron and Rod Fuller they modeled with the Ebony Fashion Fair for 10 years. Can y'all stand up? Because they were models with, with us. Whenever they were in town, they would always grace our stages with their presence. Thank you, guys. So not only did Connie and I uh, create a successful business partnership in the fashion show business, but we had an enduring and gratifying friendship. My friendship with Connie was one of authenticity. There was no morning too early. There was no night too late to call upon one another for support, direction, reassurance, and sometimes tears. And those tears were always protected by the loving, heartfelt connection that we had for 40 years. So the mutual bond between us was the expression of unity. It was trust. It was respect. It was loyalty. And it was kindness. And it was always void of any rivalry or pretense. I was Connie's confidant, and I was honored to be her confidant. She was the yin to my yang. We were just tight like that. We had an endearing sisterhood between Constance, Erica, and I. Anyone who knew Connie witnessed her kindness, her love for her entire family, especially her mom and dad, William Jones and Dr. Aretha Jones. She had a really special relationship with her mom and she called her mom mother. And one day she sent me a poem that she gave to her mother for Mother's Day. She, didn't, she wasn't the author of the poem. It said, like a butterfly emerges and unfolds its graceful wings, a child grows and develops with the love a mother brings. I'm thankful for the times when mom encouraged me to try, for God gave me my wings, but mom, you taught me how to fly. So I recall uh, before her mother's passing, uh, Mrs. Jones and I were having a conversation and Mrs. Jones said to me, she said, Karen, God could not have given me a more perfect daughter. Her parents, Bill and Aretha Jones, were married for 64 years. They didn't have any grandchildren, but their hearts were really big. So I recall Mrs. Jones would take my granddaughter, Kennedy, with her to musicals or the theater. And she brought, bought Mr. Jones a chauffeur hat. And anybody that knows Mrs. Jones knows she had this, just a soft voice. And she said, Bill, now I bought you a chauffeur's hat. And Mr. Jones wore his chauffeur's hat while he chauffeured Mrs. Jones and my granddaughter Kennedy to wherever they were going. 
So, to Connie's dad, Mr. Jones, who Connie loved dearly and took care of daily. As her mother said, she could not have had a more perfect daughter. I want to sincerely thank you for a wonderful daughter and a perfect friend. In closing, as you know now, Connie was a professional performer Connie performed in front of many, many audiences in the U.S. and abroad, and she received many standing ovations. And today we applaud her life at this final curtain. For this gift of destiny and friendship Connie and I had that came only from the Creator, I will forever be grateful. You can rest now, Connie. in the peace that only the bosom of the Lord can provide. Thank you everyone for this outpouring and honor and celebration for Constance Marie Jones, also known as Connie, who was so delightful. Karen told me I had to do this, and I had to do it like she would want me to. I'm Erica Rogers Brazil. My big sister Connie, I want to tell you three short stories to give you insight into our relationship. I don't know my life without her. I told someone that I felt like I was so heartbroken about losing her, and that it felt, felt worse than losing my father, my godfather, and one of my very close God best friends, and she said, Connie knew you longer. And I thought about it and realized she knew me 51 years, and I'm 51 years old. That caught me off guard because I had not thought about that fact. You see, we were 10 years apart and a month. For me, it was like I was born, and there she was. I don't know any aspect of my life without her. I found a note she wrote in 1994 where she wrote me a simple short paragraph. I was 21. I had just graduated from college. She wrote, you so enjoy cooking, I'm not really sure where that came from, but I don't want you to let that go. Don't stop dreaming and striving for success because I see you becoming a bigger star than I am. You know I have to... That brought me to tears because I found it last week. It made me realize she loved me even more than I knew she loved me. The first story I want to share with you um, I don't think I was even walking. I was probably less than a year old, and we were at church. Now, she has a different version of the story that she tells when we would tell it. My version is I was in the crib, or she put me in the crib, and I wanted her, and instead of me, I guess, doing as she told me, I reached and I fell. So she always would say, you did it on purpose so that I would run back and get in trouble. And I always say I did it because I just wanted to be with you. I think my version expresses the way it really happened. <laughs> she was really a big sister. The second story is, in 2002, my career was excelling. You see, I have actually walked in her footsteps. She graduated from Texas Women's University. I graduated from Texas Women's University. She started acting, modeling. I wanted to act and model. At the time, my now husband was my boyfriend, and I had just signed a deal with a modeling, agent, a modeling contract in New York. I was excited, and I called her first. My second thing to her was, I don't think this guy I'm dating wants me to be successful. She said, now, now, let's think about this, and let's pray. 
I was ready to break up with him. Little did I know he was planning to ask me to marry me and had already enlisted her support. So just to think if I had just gone off without calling her, I might not be married 20 years that we celebrated last year. Really a big sister. The last story is this. Two months ago, I signed a new contract with Kim Dawson here in Dallas. I was truly excited, and the first person I called was Connie. I had my first broadcast meeting, and before I left, I dropped a line of, you know, my god sister is Constance Jones. They stood up and said, really? Well, you should be able to get her to coach you. I said, oh, no problem. She's going to coach me in voice and acting. I'll get right on it. Of course, I hadn't asked Connie yet. I immediately call her and say, sister, your name means a lot in this town. It made her so, so excited. We started making plans immediately. And I said, you know, I really have followed in your footsteps. I can't wait for us to do this second half of life together. Sister, you will be missed beyond what words I can express. I was so lucky to have you 51 years. Thank you for a lifetime of love. I will promise to listen to your whispers and push myself to succeed for us both. I'm going to leave you with a poem she wrote in 1994 called Glory and Pain. When I dance, the world belongs to me. I'm as free as a butterfly, and it feels great to be free. When I bring up my arms, head raised to the sky, for a moment I am weightless, and I feel I can fly. When I leap across the stage, I command your attention. You're amazed at my abilities. You can't believe my extensions. But what you don't see is once the curtain comes down, my leap becomes limp, and my smile can't be found. The aches in my back are so very severe. I can't pretend any longer, and my eyes start to tear. I shut my eyes briefly to ignore my body's cries. Why do I still dance? Why keep up the lies? Because the glory of it all is ever so sweet. The audience keeps me going as they rise from their seats. The energy I feel when they cheer and they scream reminds me why I do it is fulfilling a dream. My dream to perform, to take center stage, to communicate through motion, love, sorrow, and rage. That's my life as a dancer. It must sound insane. But each moment of glory makes it all worth the pain. Sister, we know you're dancing in heaven and we will miss you forever. Sister Natalie Dyer. Amen. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every Oh, I will sing 
of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Because all my life you have been faithful. And all my so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. When my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Cause all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God. In 2004, January, 2004, I graced the stage across the street in our facility, and I had gone to Constance, and I said to Constance, I've written a play that I want to do myself. Uh, it's an adaptation. I've rewritten it. I'm not the originator of the script. It came from the Bible. I said, I've rewritten the script called The Diary of Adam and Eve. And Constance with those two dimples in her face looked me right in the face and said, Pastor, I'll be Eve. He could cry on the spot, and the most famous line of the entire script our church has always held in its heart. I'm going to share with you just 49 seconds of this video. Now, this is old VH VHS days now, y'all, so we wouldn't dare show it publicly, but I think you'll get the point here. I have two stories, and we'll be gone. Yes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. I, I promise. I, I love you. I promise. Don't, don't talk about dying. You can't leave me. She could cry life on the spot. Life without him would not be life. I don't think I could endure it. 
He he died today. I knew she would, of course. You know, I used to get real depressed whenever we had to leave the old garden. Now I've learned that wherever she was, that was Eden. My daughter and I, that was the very first play that we ever directed together. It, the famous line there was, Eve died today. And Constance could cry on the spot every rehearsal, every moment. I was so sensitive to her. A couple of days ago, I got a phone call from my daughter. I woke up and she said, Dad, Eve died today. And I laughed because I thought she was kind of making fun of the script. But in reality, Eve started a new life. January 2024. I, I could say so much, but it's all been said. I want to thank all of you for just participating today. Um, if you have just absolutely nothing to do in your life, I encourage you to go back and watch that presentation, especially those of you who understand VHS recordings and fuzziness and all of that. The Diary of Adam and Eve was the production that just made what we did in high school and as a pastor then um, of this same ministry. It brought theater live in our church and we do theater, we did theater forever. Some of you I've heard about, I've never seen before. Now I understand why she was so fond of you. To her dad and to Karen and Erica, you know, planning a funeral is a whole lot worse than planning a play because you have all of these people all of your life who have auditioned for your curtain call and you don't know the roles they play and you're going to hurt people and you're not going to get it right and you're going to do the one thing that you never do to an actor or an actress, you're going to put them on a time restraint and you're going to have an agent called a producer that's got to make sure that their star shines. And at that moment, it's called a funeral. And as a pastor, I have been blessed for 33 years to pastor this place. And when God allowed us, this being our fourth building, to build, he said, just make it look like a theater so that when people walk in, they know that they're going to be able to watch Christianity come alive. And they don't have to wonder if they're in a church, but they're in a place assembled to come together so that all kinds of theatrics can be performed that give God glory. Constance never cursed out loud. So that means she never cursed, right? She was a lady. She was everybody's aunt. I remembered, I got two stories and I'm done. And, and if you'll forgive me, if you're a Christian and you're born again, I know the Bible, I'm a pastor, but I just want to talk about something that's going to help us after today. So don't hold it against me and say, he didn't use the scripture. If I use the scripture, we'll be here longer than I thought. But once constant, <laughs> and I'm sure all of us have been I need to borrow some money. I'm sure all of us have been at the end of that line. I remember being so frustrated because I thought she needed some money once. And I said, well, Constance, don't worry about it. You know, everybody has a problem with rent and with gas and electric. We got you covered here forever. And she said, well, I need some dog food. And I'm an old Good Times fan, you know. I'm like, Connie, is that bad? And 
<laughs> she said, well, I could use some gas also. And I thought Connie had like one dog because we all, you know, I didn't know that she was bootlegging the SPCA. <laughs> but she loved animals. And in that play that you just saw, I think we had probably, this rush, I don't know, your Sherman Brown, you guys are here. We had maybe, I don't know, maybe 40 animals. We had buffalo, we had camels, we had zebras, we had horses, we had goats, we had, we had all kinds of animals. And of course she had to be Eve because there was not a female in America that would share a stage with camels using a restroom behind you, you know. And, and we, we had that magical moment. But let me tell you why I'm here. I'm here to give a eulogy uh, after all of these eulogies. And my job is to wrap it all up together. So her being an actress, her being a real player in the game of life that was to bring joy to people. I will share this with you. If you ever go to an airport, and I just asked Pastor, how did you get here? And he told me that he drove to Dallas. But he says, I drive and I fly twice a month, and my price is so high, it's kind of hard to do. This is my first story. My second one is the end. But this has to be about Constance totally. You know, when you walk at a funeral, you wonder who's in there and what's their relationship, and do they know her the way I did or the way he did? And I heard of these two guys here, the ebony, ebony fashion models, stuff I used to act like I did <laughs> in the Garanimal department. So when you go to the airport, I just want to, I'd like to share this because it is very appropriate right now. And I'm not at a loss for words. I'm just trying to keep the script down to the time. If you go to the airport, a lot of us, when we go to the airport, now I want you all in these agents, agencies, I want y'all to get this because if you're right about it, all I want is my royalties. <laughs> but you go to the airport, you'll notice all of these planes, and I love planes. I'm a plane idiot. So you go to watch planes, and you wonder sometimes, I remember when anybody could go to the airport, and you could watch people get off, you know, before the security issues back in the days. You would see all of these famous people go off, get off these planes, and you have all kind of millionaires and movie stars and professionals, and, ooh, who's on that plane? Oh, man, that's what Michael Jackson's on that plane, or the president's on that plane, or the famous actors on that plane, or some rich people. All of these planes, they come in, and they have all of these famous people and when people get off those planes, people watch them and see, wow, who are they? And how are they famous? And what did they do? And they have all kinds of money. And yet, as powerful as they are, they all ride these planes. They don't get overseas. They don't go across the world. They don't get to be known unless they get to travel by plane. And if you go to the airport, you'll notice all of these planes. But today, as we talk about Connie, let me share this with you. Next time you go to the airport, you'll notice all of these planes as they take off and you'll wonder who's on them and who lands. Wow. But if you notice as these planes, before they take off, there's this thing that most people don't notice. And there's this little blue bus that kind of pushes all of these planes away. And those people on the little blue bus, you know, I don't even know the professional name for these guys. Uh, I don't know who they are, where they live, or how they audition, or how much they make. I don't know their names. But they're always there to push these planes away. And I don't care how famous the people are. The little blue bus, their jobs are to push those planes away. And when they push those planes away, they immediately disconnect from those planes and they themselves go back to the parking space. And then all of those famous people, those rich people, those celebrities, those beautifully powerful people, they get a chance to take off and they go all over the world and they make big money and they become famous. And if you'll notice that picture there as it's stopped, 
Everybody wants to be that plane, man. Everybody wants to have those wings of eagles. Everybody wants to soar. Everybody wants to take off. Everybody wants to get going. Everybody wants to travel all over the world. Man, everybody wants to be the one that says, I made it. I took off. I left and I reached my destiny. But nobody wants to be that little blue bus. I would love to say that we're here today to celebrate the 747 and the big engines and the famous people that got to take off all over the world. But we're here today and I'm in this pulpit, not because I'm a big engine, not because I've been a powerful person to soar across the world, but because me, like you, I had a chance to experience Constance Jones, who is the little blue bus that pushed us all back so we could take off. Constance didn't do a whole lot of things, but if it wasn't for her, we would not have had a chance to be pushed back. She was the dancer, the teacher, the MC, the one who I don't know I ever got the major role, but her job was making sure that we had a chance to soar. And I think in life, there are some people, it could be your mom, your dad, your grandparents, they don't get famous. They don't travel all over the world. Their main job is to just push you back so you can take off. Sometimes kids get very frustrated because parents push them, push them, and push them. And some of these parents would never be superstars. They'll never be rock stars. They'll never be YouTube celebrities. But somebody had to push all of us back so that all of us could take off. And that's what I'm hearing that Constance was to all of us, right? She pushed us so that we could take off. That's my first story. The last story will be six minutes and 13 seconds. When I was a little boy, my mom, we were very poor. And when I would tell Constance the stories of how I was brought up, you know, she would immediately sometimes go into that cry. I, I, this is not a script, girl, stop. <laughs> but I remember being a boy and my mother would get home every day at 4.30. Now, we didn't have a clock that I remember in the projects of Dallas, we didn't have a clock, Reverend. We always told time by TV. Yeah. <laughs> and some of y'all don't know what this word is I'm about to use, but we were some uppity Negroes. Yeah, we were poor, but we were kind of uppity. Uppity was like a sadity word that we use in our neighborhood. I can talk to some real people that are not, are not line dancers. We, we, we were sadity because we had two TVs. Most Negroes had one TV. We had two TVs, uh-huh. One of those TVs was for the sound. The other was for the picture. <laughs> so we had two TVs. Uh, and when the sound wasn't working, we could just look, you know, what it was. And, and so we never knew what time it was. And my mom would always say, when I got home from work, she said, Ricky, I want this house to be straightened out. And I want this house to be in order. Well, how did we know what time it was? Every time mom would come home from work, there would be a show on the television called Popeye the Sailor. Now, if you're anything under 50, you just wait, we'll be back. <laughs> Popeye the Sailor would come on. Popeye was this character who would get upset if somebody would mess with his little bony, skinny girlfriend, Olive Oil. Popeye would come on, and when Popeye would come on, I knew to be in the house because Mama would be home. Well, before Papa came on, every day Mama would leave in the morning and she'd get back in the evening and she would say, if this house is not in order, I'm going to whip you behind. And unlike Constance, my Mama did say some other words. I knew what that meant, but I knew I had from early in the morning till Papa came on, which was about 4.30, I knew I had all day to play around, fool around, act the fool, be crazy with the kids in the projects, just get home before Papa the sailor came on. One day, my mama came home, and all my children was on. Now, if you're not from the projects, you don't know what I'm talking about. I'm talking to us uppity Negroes right now. 
about all my children was on. All my children was like uh, Erica Kane, uh, Palmer Cortland, uh, Jesse, Opa Gardner. It happened in Pine Valley. Some of y'all getting it, huh? Yeah. And so mama came home one day and some kids said, hey, Ricky, your mama's here. And I said, oh, no, no, she can't be here now because all my children is on. And I looked outside and my mama was coming across the field. I ran through the back door. My mama came through the front door. My mama went inside the house and she stood in the front door as I came through the back. And now I see her. And I'm breathing because I know this is the day that I will see Jesus, Martin Luther King Jr. You know, all this stuff is going to happen because this is the end of it. My mom never said a word. She just reached outside and she grabbed a little flower of the bush. And she took her hand and she grabbed this in. Look at these actors, actresses, and act it out with me right now. And she pulled this part. And all these leaves fell off. And it went from a bush to a, listen to the project people out there. <laughs> and at that point, my mom started to just, it was like tickling. I couldn't tell what was going on. But all over me, she just started whipping me with this switch. Now, I need um, one of the ladies from the agency stood up, stand up for a minute, that came up here to talk. I want y'all to look. Look at her for a minute. Go ahead, stand up. Now, you see her back in the projects. That's what we used to call light skin. <laughs> now, look at me. All my life, I've been black. I've never pretended to try to be any lighter than I am. And stand up for a second. See, if you hit her with a switch, she's going to leave little red marks called state evidence. <laughs> you can have a seat now. But if you hit me with a switch, as black as I am, I'm going to break out in ash. Now, how do you take care of ash? You just lick it and wipe it. You may be seated. And so my mom, all those years, man, they were all over us. And, and, and she was just getting us, and I had no evidence that I was getting spanked like that. Now, I'm just telling this story, first of all, because it's true. And I just thought it'd be kind of fun, because that's the kind of conversation all of us have had with Constance. But I'm telling that story today because I want you to know one thing. My mom didn't whip me that day because I was bad. She knew I was bad. She didn't whip me that day, Karen and Erica, Mr. Jones. She didn't whip me that day because I lied. She knew I lied all the time. She didn't whip me that day, brothers, because I was with the wrong group. She knew I had bad friends. But my mom whipped me that day because she came home early. But she caught me with my work undone. I didn't have my house in order. I knew I could wait till Popeye was coming on. I knew it would take me like 30 seconds to clean up. But this day she came home hours early. Hey, y'all. We got a question. What happened to Constance? What did, this, what did the script say happened to Constance? What, what really went on? Can, can, do we have an answer? Can somebody tell us what happened to Constance? I don't want to know. But as her pastor, I want you to know something. I don't know what happened to her. But I know that since she got called early, Constance had a house in order. And that's ultimately all that matters. The end. Well done, my sister. Come on, let's give her another hand. If your script comes to an end tomorrow, do you have your house in order? Right now. You could live to be 100 or you can leave at 27. Just make sure daddy comes home early. You got your house in order. All of our hearts and minds clear. Are we all happy in some kind of way? Are you grateful 
for being here today. I invite all of you to get somewhere, get right with God, get your house in order. You're not going to go to hell because you had bad friends. You're not going to go to hell because somebody said something, lied on you, wrote something about your name. Don't worry about your reputation. God said, God, your heart. But you will see his face if you got your house in order. I want you to focus on the video behind me as we get ready to leave now. We want to do everything the family asks us to do. And as this video is playing, our funeral directors are going to be walking down at the same time, and we'll end up going out together. Take me to the key. I don't have much to bring. My heart is torn in pieces. It's my offering. Take me to the key. Truth is, I'm tired. Options are few. I'm trying to pray, but where are you? I'm all church down, hurt and abused. I can't think what's left to do. Come on. Truth is, I'm no strength to fight, no tears to cry, even if I tried, but still my soul refuses to die. Again, we're going to remind everyone to be as cautious as possible and help us with our barriers around Brother Jones. As um, we were going to ask that you not embrace him. That sounds so awkward to have to say, but please understand not to embrace Dad or give him his space. So we're going to follow our directors out to the lobby. You may stand.